Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to a brand new Mod Spotlight, the first Mod Spotlight of the Minecraft 1.16 generation. Today, taking a look at Create. Oh yeah, it's time. Uh, Create, if you guys haven't seen it before, is an amazing mod. It's one of those mods that just changes the landscape of modded Minecraft. Um, there's a lot of complexity here. There's a lot of things that all are just different pieces that can be put together to build contraptions. So unlike a lot of mods that we see anymore, there's not just a block that you place down that does a thing. There are many blocks that have individual functions that you need to put together in certain ways to accomplish your goals. And this is going to absolutely be a multi-part mod spotlight. There's a lot uh, to cover here. So our first episode, which is this one, is going to cover uh, the basics of kinetics so that you guys can understand how these basic functionalities work. Things like generating um, stress units and, and generating kinetic energy and transferring kinetic energy around. And then we're also going to probably cover in today's episode, depending on time, item logistics, how to move items around using the create system. And then as we progress through uh, several episodes of Mod Spotlights, we'll get into things like fluid logistics, uh, machines and materials and how to process things, uh, how to build moving contraptions that can move around and do automations for you in the world, all kinds of complexities that you can put together uh, all these pieces of this mod to build some really cool stuff. So without further ado, let's get started looking at Create. So first off, let's mention World Gen. Uh, there's copper and zinc that get added, and then a few individual blocks uh, of things that you're going to need uh, to find. Some of them are more useful than others, and a lot of them are just decorative, which is cool. Not a problem with that. But just keep in mind that you're going to need to find some ores uh, out in your world to get started and get going. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to have a lot of are mechanical belts, and these mechanical belts are made with dried kelp. So get yourself some kelp, okay? Trust me on that. So how does one get started in Create? Most of the machines in Create use something called rotational force. So you're going to need to find a block that can provide rotational force. One of the most early ways of doing this is the water wheel. It basically takes running water and turns it into rotational force. The nice thing about this is it doesn't cost anything other than setting it up. So making yourself a water wheel is pretty straightforward. It uses mostly wood and a little bit of andesite and iron. You're going to go ahead and place your water wheel in the world, uh, and then you need to get flowing water running over it. So however you want to make this happen, it's pretty straightforward to do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, place a few blocks here to make it very obvious how the water is flowing. You want the flow of the water to catch the water wheels in the right way, and you probably want it to, to land somewhere and stop. So let's go ahead and place a water block like this, and you'll notice that as the water runs over the water wheel, it starts turning it. Pretty cool. Not too shabby. You'll also notice that the more sides of the block that are touched by flowing water, the faster it's going to turn. So notice the speed of this uh, rotation right now. If we break this block right here and then place a block here, what we're going to wind up having is a, a flowing water block directly above this one that touches the water wheel, causing it to spin faster. Ready? Watch. Notice it's spinning faster because now there's another flowing block touching it. So we are now creating rotational force, which is what's going to power most of the machines from Create. Uh, it should also be noted that bubble columns can power this machine as well. If we want to transfer this rotational force somewhere else, there's a lot of things that can do it. The first and most basic is the shaft, which relays rotational force in a straight line. When you place it, you'll see an arrow indicating the direction of the rotational force that's being moved. And as we place more and more shafts on this line here, we'll see exactly what's happening is those shafts are being rotated by the water wheel. We can also move other shafts with these shafts by connecting them courtesy of the mechanical belt. Simply click on one shaft with the mechanical belt and you'll notice that as you try to move it to another, some green particle effects appear between the two, indicating that this connection will be created when you click on the second shaft. Doing so creates a belt. And now we've got rotational energy being relayed across the belt to this shaft over here. It should also be noted that belts can be used to transfer items, and we'll get into some more of the nuances of this as the spotlight goes on. So now that we're generating rotational energy, let's go ahead and use it. One of the first machines you might want to use is the mechanical press. And as you can see, you can hold shift on any item to read more information about how the mechanical press works. The basic information is shown at the top. The amount of stress impact, which we'll talk about shortly, is listed underneath that. And then some other details, if 
they exist are listed even further down, like what happens when it's powered by redstone, what happens when it's sitting above a mechanical belt, and what happens when it's sitting above a basin. And we'll show some of these examples in just a moment here. So we're gonna go ahead and place the, uh, the, the mechanical press right on the shafts, and you'll see that this thing is spinning here. And we're going to place a depot underneath it. And the depot is what's going to allow you to place items underneath the press and have it start operating on them. If you want to see what the press can make, you can hit uh, U if you have JEI installed and see the usages of this machine. You'll notice that depending on what's underneath the mechanical press determines what it's going to do. So it can do some automated packaging for you and compress items. It can also uh, do some compacting and create certain things for you. And finally, it can do presses to make things like metal sheets. And in order for it to do a press, it neither needs to be above a belt or above a depot. You also want to have one block space in between the uh, press and the depot. So I'm going to go ahead and just drop a gold ingot on there. And as soon as we do so, you'll see the press springs into action. Hooray! And we've made our very first uh, golden sheet. You can also just right click an item on there and it'll go ahead and be placed as well. So rather than dropping, you can right click. There's a few interactions we can do as well. And you can right click with an empty hand to pick up the item. And now that you've got some gold sheets, it's probably a good time to make some engineer's goggles. Engineer's goggles will allow you to see real time in world a lot of information about what is happening with your machine. So as long as you have these equipped, you'll see what's going on. If you don't, you won't. Pretty cool. So you'll notice that it's giving us some kinetic stats about this press. 128 stress units are being used at the current speed. And if we look over here at the generator, we can see we're producing 256 stress units at the current speed. So the way this works is your generators create rotational energy and stress units. If you overwhelm the stress units, meaning that you place more machines on one system than your generators are producing, then you will not be able to operate anymore. All the machines will seize up. So we can probably at this speed run, based on the numbers here, two mechanical presses. However, any more and we'd be in trouble. We'd be having uh, overwhelming our stress units. Now I also mentioned that this can work on a belt. So let's demonstrate how that works. I'm going to go ahead and put a couple shafts here. And I'm going to connect a belt. We mentioned belts can connect uh, horizontally. They can also be connected vertically or at a 45 degree angle. So if you want to connect a belt to a 45 degree angle like so, you can. And I'm going to go ahead and place another shaft over here and connect the belt like so. Now we have a belt running across. What we can do is drop a gold ingot on the belt and the um, mechanical press will automatically process the gold item on the belt and then allow it to proceed. Pretty cool, look at that. And the item will pop off the belt or it'll go into an inventory. We'll see inventory manipulation in just a bit. It should be noted doing things like this add to the stress units of the machine. So we can see at this moment that there's definitely some stress impact happening as a result of having belts and other things going on. If you wanna know more information about the stress units, go ahead and place another shaft on somewhere and check out the stressometer. The stressometer will tell you information about what's happening um, stress-wise in your machine. So we can see right now that the gauge is telling us there's a moderate amount of stress. Out of the capacity 256 stress units that are provided by the generator over here, we are using, uh, or we only have remaining 112. So we're using about 56% of them. And as we remove blocks from this thing, we'll see that number reduce. Pretty cool. And now we're down to 50% or 128 stress units. And this bar will go ahead and adjust itself depending on how stressed we're making the network. So an example might be, and this is just to demonstrate how this works, we would place another press right there. And then we could go ahead and have, for example, this guy coming over here and our stressometer, we're now at 100% capacity and we'll see we're in the red zone. If we tried to add yet another uh, mechanical press here, we would overwhelm it. Ta-da, overstressed. We have, you know, 128 times three, that is more than the 256 stress units that this generator can produce. To solve this problem, let's add another generator. So I'm simply going to add another water wheel here, and we're going to replicate what we had a moment ago. So we're going to keep this here, and we will add a water source block right here. 
And now you'll know that we are moving this thing once again. So now we are generating uh, 256 stress units for each generator. And if we come over here and add our stressometer, we can see that we have a total capacity of 512 with 128 remaining. So to recap, your generators produce rotational energy and also produce stress. In addition to that, uh, the machines that do things for you use rotational energy and use up the stress that is available, the stress units that are available. Um, so the more machines you build, the more generators of rotational energy and the more generators of stress capacity you're going to need. Now you might notice that one of the nuances here was the stress impact is 120 stress units at current speed. What does that mean? You can actually speed up these machines using some interesting mechanics courtesy of cogwheels. So let's remove the press that we have here and place a large cogwheel on the end of this machine. You'll notice the cogwheel is spinning at the same speed as the water wheel that's turning it. However, we can now augment this with a small cogwheel. And you'll notice that when we place the small cogwheel, especially when wearing engineer's goggles, and the same goes for the large cogwheel, we can see these little particle effects indicating the speed of the objects. So blue means it's running a little bit faster. And if you kind of pay attention here, you'll notice the small cogwheel is definitely being turned faster. And this is just a basic principle of physics. A large cogwheel will spin a small cogwheel faster. We can see now that if we place a mechanical press on this small cogwheel, it's using 256 stress units. So it's running twice as fast, creating twice as much stress, but it also allows you to do uh, operations a lot quicker. Remember a moment ago when we were creating uh, some gold plates. I'm gonna go ahead and drop another piece of gold ingot on here and demonstrate that this thing runs a little bit quicker. And if you don't believe me, go back in the video a few seconds and see how much faster that is. Now, if we want, we can speed things up even faster. We can place, for example, and this is somewhat optional, we don't need to place this shaft here, but just to make things a little bit larger and visible, we can place a large cogwheel connected to the small one. Now, if we wanted to, we could absolutely just do this. And you'll notice that the cogwheel is spinning at the same speed with the blue particle effects as the small cogwheel behind it. And now we can just repeat exactly what we just did. So all we have to do is place another small cogwheel here and it's moving that much faster. Pretty cool. Now we're using up 512 stress units at the current speed of this thing turning. And you'll find eventually that several machines have certain speed requirements as you progress through the mod. So if we place this here now, notice how much faster the belt stamping is. This also affects the speed of belts. So if we connect some belts here, you'll notice that they're running a lot faster than earlier. And if we drop any item on there, they'll be transported across the belt that much faster. There is an eventual speed limit, so you can't make this go forever fast, but you can get them pretty darn quick if you do it the right way. Curious as to what speed things are running? Go ahead and use a speed ometer. It will tell you what the RPM of the gear shaft it's connected to is running at. So this is running at 16 RPMs, where this one is running at 32. No surprise. This one, any guesses? Oh, you're right, 64. And then this one, 128. We're getting pretty fast. This one here, 256. We're pegging the line. And if we jump up to this one, we'll note that it breaks when you try to add it on there. Too fast. 256 RPM, going pretty fast. It's also 256 stress units. So having a belt moving this fast is quite a lot of stress, but it also adds for some hilarious effects as you drop items onto the belt. It should be noted, however, that if you want a, a metal press to run at 256 RPM, you're gonna need quite a large amount of stress units available. So be prepared. So another interesting trick you can do with these cog wheels is you can connect them like so. And this will allow you to set up some verticality. So if you want to start spinning things like so, you can go ahead and manage machines that need to receive uh, rotational energy from the top or bottom. And an even further trick is placing another one right here 
And you'll notice that what this effectively does is reverse the direction of rotation. So this one is turning clockwise while this one is turning counterclockwise. And if we wanted to be super fancy, we could probably put one right here. And you'll notice that the top one is spinning one way and the bottom one is spinning another. But this is a little bit big to go ahead and make all at once. So we can compact this down into a single block that Create is kind enough to give us called the Gearbox. Relays rotation in four directions. This specific one that I've shown here is a vertical gearbox. Uh, but you could imagine that we could turn this sideways and we get a regular gearbox. So the vertical gearbox does exactly what I just demonstrated to you, like so. And you'll notice now that this guy is spinning clockwise still, but on this side, we're spinning counterclockwise. And we also have a top and a bottom. So the gearbox is what I just demonstrated in World. You can also set up a, a regular gearbox. That's the vertical. The regular gearbox works like so, and it's the equivalent if we had just put the gears on the sides rather than on the top and the bottom. And like so, we can demonstrate the four directions that things are spinning. Alternatively, like I mentioned, we have the vertical gearbox. Now, if you want to get a little fancier with your rotational energy, you can take a look at the gear shift or the clutch. The clutch basically is a shaft, but if you give it a redstone signal, it will stop the rotational direction. Boom. So this one keeps turning, but this stops. So given a redstone signal, you can control this. Very simple and straightforward. Uh, the other one is the gear shift. What this does is it uses a redstone signal to determine whether or not to reverse the direction of rotation. So notice we're currently turning clockwise. Redstone signal, we're turning counterclockwise. The next little bit of trickery is the encased chain drive. Relays rotation in a straight line and to adjacent encased chain drives. Chain drives connect to a group when placed next to another on any face without a shaft. Their orientation does not have to match. So basically, you place down one of these dudes and you place one next to it, and it does that. It's a, it's a nice way to get two adjacent um, gears turning without just placing belts next to them. You could achieve the same thing by placing two next to each other and just placing belts on them, but this is another way to go. Uh, in addition to that, you have the adjustable chain gear shift, which works pretty much the same way. However, it responds to a redstone signal, and if you give it a full strength redstone signal, it will double the speed of the adjacent uh, rotational energies. So you can see these shafts are spinning twice as fast as this one. Pretty cool. And that's dependent on the strength of the redstone signal. So off is 1x, Full redstone signal is 2x, and anything in between will be a variant of, right? So if you gave it a redstone signal of like, say, 7 or 8, it's going to be around 1.5 times instead of double. It should be noted that these things can work horizontally or vertically, but not both at the same time. So note that if I do this, only the side ones are going, but if I remove these two side ones, it'll allow the vertical ones, but not the side ones at the same time. So basically it's horizontal or vertical, but yes, you can add one here like so. It also should be noted that these things can rotate, so we can do something like this. Pretty cool. So long story short, between um, using some gearboxes and some clutches and gear shifts and drive chains, you should have a pretty easy way to reallocate the direction of rotational energy and set up your, your, your stuff however you want. If you want to change the direction it's currently spinning or go from horizontal to vertical, lots of different ways to do that with these different blocks. And it should be noted that there's one other generator I haven't really talked about yet. There's several that I haven't talked about, but one of the starter generators is the hand crank. This one, as you might expect, you simply right click to generate stress units. 256 stress units and a little bit of rotational energy, um, but this does consume hunger if you're not in creative mode like I am. So now that we've seen the basics of manipulating rotational energy, choosing what direction it's moving and all that cool stuff, let's look a little bit about item transfer and how to transfer items using belts. And then, like I said, in a future episode, we'll get into a lot of the different machines that we can use this rotational energy for to make items, do crafting, and have some things happen in world. 
So I'd like to go ahead and uh, demonstrate how to transfer items around. I'm going to have it run a little bit faster, throw, throw a cogwheel down here. It should be noted, though, that when you do this connection with a cogwheel, you wind up with a reversal of your speed. So this is going uh, clockwise. This is now going counterclockwise. So if you want to reverse that, just go ahead and throw a gearbox somewhere along your line. And now you've got it going the direction you may or may not want it to go. Let's go ahead and uh, have some items transfer along this belt. Not too far. But we'll do something like this and place down this guy. Players, by the way, can totally ride on this thing. Whee! And other entities. But mostly items, as we saw earlier. So first off, one way to automate this is with vanilla hoppers. You can go ahead and just place items in there, and the hopper will place items on the belt for you. Very simple and straightforward. However, if you want to be a little bit fancier for interacting with your belts, you're probably going to want to make a funnel. There are two types to make, the andesite, which is the very basic and simple one, or the brass funnel, which is a little bit more complex, which we'll talk about in a moment. The andesite funnel, in general, will collect items from the ground in front of it. They can also be used to interact with the mechanical arm, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. Uh, the main purpose of this is when mounted on belts, depots, and similar. It either collects or places on the belt from or to the inventory behind itself. Um, if it has specific directionality, it'll automatically orient. If it doesn't, you get to decide using the wrench, which I've already gotten myself. So let's talk about specific directionality. This, when you place the funnel, for example, on the ground, it looks like this. However, if you place it on a chest right above a belt, you will see that it looks a little something like this. This has specific directionality. It's the same direction that the belt is moving. So we know this will always extract items from the chest. So let's go ahead and put some grass in there, for example. The uh, funnel here will go ahead and extract items from the chest and place it on the belt. Similarly, if we place one on the opposite side here, it will go ahead and accept items, like so. Pretty cool. Look at that. Not too shabby. Now, in addition to this, we can go ahead and place one that's not in line with the belt's directionality, and it'll try and have to figure out what it wants to do by itself. An example would be placing it like so. Right now, the arrow here, which is a little bit hard to see unless you know what you're looking for, but there's an arrow here that's pointing out. This means it's in ex extract mode. If I hit it with a wrench, it'll flip it to insert mode, which means that this guy will go ahead and, ex and, and take items off the belt. However, if I were to put it on extract mode like so, it's going to go ahead and start extracting items from its chest and putting them on the belt. Pretty cool. It should be noted that this behavior can be uh, affected by a redstone signal. So for example, if we were to allow this thing to start running again, and we gave it a redstone signal, it would stop. Now, if you want a slightly fancier funnel, go ahead and check out the brass version of the funnel. This guy, the main differences are that you can filter them, and you can also specify how many items can be extracted at a time. Generally speaking, the andesite one can only do a single item at a time, while the brass one can do up to a stack at a time, and you get to specify that. So let's take a look. So what I'm going to go here is uh, place, for example, some grass blocks in here. Notice it pulled out a whole stack at once. Awesome. We can also scroll here to specify exactly how many items get extracted at a time. I used my scroll wheel to change this and we set it to six. It's now extracting six items at a time. Pretty spiffy. Just use your scroll wheel to adjust that as you see fit. So if we set it to 16, as you can see there, and we go ahead and throw some grass blocks in there, we'll see we're getting 16 items at a time being extracted. Nice. In addition, the brass funnels allow you to use filters, and of course there are two types of that as well. The more basic one is just called filter, and it's just a little bit of iron and wool. All it does is give you a screen where you can specify whether this is a deny list or an allow list. For example, I'll place grass blocks in our allow list. You can also specify whether you should respect data or not, meaning if the sword is broken or if the sword has an enchant, if it should match. Uh, you can also hit the trash button here to completely clear out the filter, and if you want, you can shift click to add items to the filter easily. Hit the checkbox to apply, and then apply your filter right here. Ta-da! And now you can again scroll to specify how many items are extracted at a time. So let's do eight items at a time. We specify that grass is the only thing that's allowed to be re uh, removed from here, and now glass is not. We'll also put cogwheels in, but if I throw grass blocks in there, you'll see they're being extracted. Pretty cool. The same can be done on the inserting end, especially for something like this. So if we wanted to say, hey, we want everything, let's say for example, uh, grass can go in here, but everything else should go in here. Let's set that up. What I'll do is remove this filter that I just inserted here by doing a right click 
and then we get the filter back to our inventory. Everything is being picked up over here now, which makes sense. But we don't want that. We only want grass to go in there, right? So let's go ahead and click our grass into here. And now we're going to remove these items and place them all inside this chest. And we'll see that it's extracting a stack of items at a time. The glass and cogwheels pass by, but the grass actually goes in here because we filtered it. Pretty straightforward. I should also note that you can specify on this guy the stack size that can be accepted. So for example, we specified this guy extracts stacks of four at a time. And we'll notice that they're not being pulled in here. However, if I mouse wheel this down and say you can accept stacks of size four, it'll start picking them up. But if we set it back to eight or nine, it won't. You can also add just a single item to the filter at once. So if you want, for example, to filter grass only, you can do that without creating the filter item. You just need the filter item if you want to filter more than one type of item at a time or get more specific with your allow, deny, and respect or ignore data settings. So now that we've learned a bit about funnels, let's learn a little bit about tunnels. Tunnels are a nice way uh, to set up your systems that can split items across multiple belts. So let's say that we had a belt something like this. And we had a mechanical thingy here, and we wanted to split items across the belts. In this case, we'd want to use a, a tunnel. So reading the tooltip on the tunnel tells us that it's a protective cover for your mechanical belts. Andesite tunnels can split off one item from a stack when another belt or depot is placed at the side of the main belt. In other words, you want your stack size to be greater than one or nothing will happen. So make sure you have at least a stack size of two. Uh, and we can go ahead and throw, for example, some grass in here. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna split each stack in half and make it one for one to go off in that direction. Pretty cool. It should be also noted that this can deposit onto depots. So if you wanted to do something like so, uh, we'll see what happens here. I'm gonna go ahead and put the 32 in here and we'll see one, one, and then one, and then that one. Pretty cool, not too shabby. And this will hold up the belt until this depot's free and same here. Pretty nice way to automate some stamping. It's also just decorative if you want. So if you place several in a row like this, you'll get a pretty fancy window. Now, if you really want to get fancy, check out the brass tunnel. This thing is just bananas. There's a ton of things it can do. So let's take a look at some of them. First off, it can filter when it splits. It can split in different ways. Uh, and there's just a ton of things it can do. So first off, place it down just like the andesite tunnel. And if you're looking at the top while holding a wrench, it'll tell you what it's doing. When multiple outputs available, it will split or scroll this to change it to forced split or round robin, or forced round robin, or prefer nearest, or randomize, or synchronize inputs, and that's about it. That's a lot of things. So let's first take a look at split, which is a pretty straightforward process. What this means is if we have an item stack of two at a time coming out of a chest, it will split them so that an item stack of two becomes one and one. If we make it an item stack of, say, 16, it'll go eight and eight. Let's take a look. I'm gonna go ahead and throw this in here and it's gonna move 16 at a time and it's gonna do eight and eight. So that 32 went over here and eight at a time are coming into my inventory here. Nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this output to eight and block this belt over here so I can show you the difference between split and forced split. So what split does is it'll try to split the stacks, but if it can't, that's okay. It'll just keep going where it can. So for example, when we've got this happening right here, we can see that it's taking four and four, and then four and four, and then four and four, and eventually this belt's gonna get gummed up, and this thing's gonna be like, oh, that belt's gummed up. Well, I'm gonna keep sending the four and four at a time here. But remember, it's gonna slow down the input a little bit because it has to send four, and then four, and then four, and then four, keeps going forward. But eventually what happens is we wind up with 44 over here, and we know that we're gonna have about 20, which is, you know, five stacks of four over here. Now the alternative to that is setting it to forced split, which as you can probably imagine, once this belt gums up and gets stuck, the other belt is gonna stop allowing inputs. And that's what we're gonna see right now. No more movement until this belt gets a little bit of relief. Once we go ahead and relieve some of the uh, items on this belt, it will be allowed to run again. Pretty cool. Now round robin will send the entire stack in alternate directions. So rather than four going that way and four coming this way in a stack of eight, it'll send eight here, and then the next stack, eight will come here, and then eight, and then eight. 
So we can demonstrate that pretty easily right now. We'll see that eight are going in at a time. So note, eight went that way, eight went this way, eight went that way, eight went this way. So that's round robin versus split. And you can probably imagine uh, what the difference is between forced round robin and not. So I'm going to go ahead and make this guy a size of four. And let's go ahead and throw the grass blocks in here. What we're going to find is with it set to regular round robin, when this belt gets stuck, it's going to allow the items to continue on this belt. Notice that happening right now. However, if I switch this guy to forced round robin, that will no longer be the case, and it won't be allowed to uh, send items at all until both belts have availability. Once we relieve the items on this belt, it'll be allowed to start going again until this belt gums up once more. Got it? So that's the difference between forced and uh, unforced round robin or split. Uh, prefer, prefer nearest? Uh, well, that makes uh, some sense, doesn't it? They're both near. Well, there's more that this bronze guy can do, brass guy. And as you can see, there's a filter on these brass slots, so you can very easily just apply a filter. And just like with the uh, other things, you can use you know, these filters to uh, filter what items go where. So if you wanted to, you could go ahead and drop some, uh, some grass and some glass in there, and then the grass will go the one way, and the glass will go the other. Pretty cool. But wait, there's more. There's even more cool things that this brass tunnel can do because they can combine with other brass tunnels to do something really spiffy. So let's take a look at doing that. So what I'm gonna say is, let's say we had four belts that we wanted to split across. We're gonna go ahead and set those up very quickly, like so. And then we'll place down some chests. And of course, we're gonna want some brass funnels. Now we can go ahead and place the tunnels here and they will join and link together like so to do whatever splitting you want. So note here that we're currently set to round robin. All of these guys are set to round robin. It's basically a multi-block. And if we change one, for example, to split, it's gonna change them all. Pretty cool. So let's try splitting stacks of 16. Let's do that. What it's gonna do is it's gonna take a stack of 16 and it's gonna go four, 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 four. Let's try it out, shall we? So I'm gonna do just that. We're gonna put a stack of 16 grass blocks in here and we should see it split to four in all the belts. Wow, fancy, not too shabby, pretty cool. And we can do the same with uh, round robin, for example. So if we did that and we set this guy to, I don't know, stacks of you know four at a time and we'll throw another 16 in there, it's gonna do four and then four and then four and then four. Pretty neat. Um, and obviously the same rules for forced mode work as well. Uh, prefer nearest? Well, you got a probably good idea of what that's gonna do, I would think. So what I'm gonna do is just break this importer here and uh, we're gonna set this guy's input. Eh, we'll keep him at four, let's say, and we'll see how it goes. So what should happen, uh, I'm gonna break this guy's input as well, just to demonstrate how it's gonna go. It's gonna prefer the nearest belt. So it'll start loading up this belt, and then when this belt's full, it'll start loading up that one, and then when this one's full, it'll start loading up the next, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so prefer nearest is a nice you know, approach that you can go there. Pretty cool. You can also do randomize if you want. I'm not gonna demonstrate. You probably have a good idea of what that does. And then synchronize inputs. It's basically the reverse. So if we had this going the opposite direction, it would take four inputs onto one output belt. And finally, what I'd like to show you guys is a shoot. This is a pretty straightforward and basic block, so I probably should have shown this before, the complexity of the brass ones, but eh, whatever. So the shoot is how you can put items onto or pull them off of belts vertically. So for example, if you wanted an item placed on this belt, you would do so uh, by placing a chute on top. You can either drop items in, or you can place the items uh, on top of it via the depots or a chest. So for example, if you wanted to throw some smooth stone in here, it would shoot onto the chest right uh, from the chest onto the belt, like so. It can also be used to pull items off of belts, like so. So if we were to place a chest down here with a chute on top, when we place items inside here, they'll go ahead and get pulled off of the belt via the chute and dropped into the chest underneath it. Chutes have a few other features when interacted with fans, but we haven't talked about fans just yet, so we'll see that in a future episode. 
And I think that about wraps it up for the first episode of the Create Mod Spotlight. Hopefully I've enlightened you guys into some of the basics of Create, but we haven't even scratched the surface of what this mod is capable of. The purpose of this video was to show you the very basics, to get you to understand the simple mechanics of Create. Now we get to put them all together to build some ridiculous machines. We can build automatic drillers and miners and harvesters and trains and all kinds of crazy stuff, which we'll be checking out in the next few episodes of this spotlight. For now, Dull20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode and take it easy.